as Cliff would put it, be people behaving in front of me when I'm doing anthropology are simply enacting, enacted documents. Everything is a text ready to be interpreted. And Cliff would say that's what Max Weber said. But when you read Max Weber, you realize that he was not one of them linguisticos. <laughs> Max Weber was talking about significance. He was talking about making sense of things, making sense of social situations, but he also gives examples of making sense of machines. Understanding how a machine works is not a matter of utilizing linguistic categories for the different parts. Oh, so this is a category piston. Or so it's understanding how the connections, you may even have to take it apart, you may even have to play a little bit with it to make sense of the inner workings of the machine. It's explaining a mechanism. Even if the mechanism is not a clockwork mechanism or steam engine or transistor, even if the mechanism involves reasons and motives. That's when you explain, why did he do that? Well, you know, or for instance, when, when you say things like, why do the British drive on the wrong side of the road? I mean, that doesn't it, like, doesn't it impress you as weird? I mean, it's like all of a sudden, you know, everybody else in the world drives on one side of the road, and they just went, I don't care, man. I'm going to drive on the other side of the road. You know? You don't have to postulate motives to explain it, you just postulate reasons. Because it is a convention in England. You know, a road can be actually taken both ways, just like a clock, just like a watch could be going <coughs> clockwise or counterclockwise. <coughs> there really is no difference. Just one of the two got established and the symmetry got broken. And there's conventions that break the symmetry and they get broken different ways in different countries. So all the times when you need to explain why Somewhere somebody does that, you're not asking just for reasons, you know, you know, in his culture that's the way it is, you're asking for motives. But either way, it was all about social explanation, what Max Weber was talking about with his method, not social interpretation, like Clifford Beards and, and, and other cultural anthropologists have claimed. So one of the main sources of problem is not to understand the word meaning has two meanings, as I said, one day historians in the future are going to laugh at us because it is ridiculous. One more point. Another great source of confusion, which also needs to be removed before we can begin to understand Hume. This is a distinction that has been made by the philosopher Gilbert Rye, a British philosopher who drove on the other side of the road but who nevertheless got it right when it came to knowledge. Ryle, in a book called The Concept of Mind, a book that is not read nearly widely enough today, people should get back to Ryle, Ryle is from the 1940s, but because he didn't really left disciples, at least not disciples of his son's stature, it's it is ripe for someone to go in there and get so much stuff. It's like a gold mine. He distinguished two types of knowledge, again, linguistic and non-linguistic. He said, we have on one hand, knowing that, followed by a blank. And we have on the other hand, knowing how, okay, followed by a blank. Mm -hmm. Knowing that is the more familiar knowledge. That blank is typically filled by a declarative sentence. It's a fact-staging sentence, like Columbus discovered America in 1492, or the Yankees won the World Cup in 2000, and whatever it was. Those are specific sentences with specific form. They can, they can state correct facts, or they can state entirely false facts, like, I know that if I die as a martyr, 70 virgins in heaven will be waiting for me. You know? I don't know about you guys, but the numbers sound suspicious. <laughs> Way too many versions. Seven in it. And how do you get that many in just one place? Not for everyone. There's got to be like a, a, a virgin factory on okay. you know this. Like something <coughs> out. Like, 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 <coughs> like a mass production assembly line thing. Hey, virgin number 2006. Virgin 2007. <laughs> this is what most philosophers consider knowledge is. Knowledge of sentences, knowledge of truths, 
explained, I mean expressed in sentences. And so we have here linguistic content. It's a semantic content of a sentence or a proposition, which is what you know here. Proposition is simply the meaning of a declarative sentence. What? The sentence is snow is white and la nieve is blanca have in common. Words are entirely different, the letters are entirely different, and yet la nieve is blanca means exactly the same thing as snow is white, and so they express the same proposition. This is a technical term, I introduce it so that we can fill the blank here with something. Knowing how is not about language. Knowing how is learning a skill, and it's always followed by a verb in the infinitive. Deleuze was in love with infinitive verbs. In fact, he claims they are one of the most deterritorialized parts of language, precisely because they express pure events. To burn, to cut, to die, to bleed, to love, to green. And so imagine now we start using some <coughs> infinitive verbs there and say, knowing how to ride a bicycle, knowing how to swim, now, knowing how to write a bicycle, this is knowledge that's taught by example and is learned by doing. It's non-linguistic. You may use words, but they are typically reassuring words or guiding words or words that serve as, you know, as an accompaniment to the, to the process. Not, they don't contain the knowledge. You have to be a very sadistic dad to put your kid on a, for the first time on a bicycle, you know, on a very, you know, steep hill, and, you know, did you read the book I told you about how to ride a bicycle? And then, okay, good luck. <laughs> Don't forget to say hello to your grandpa when you get down there. It's like the cemetery. <coughs> Knowing how to, in other words, to, to know how to ride a bicycle, you need to mount a bicycle. You need to become part of an assemblage with the bicycle, a piece of solid ground, and a gravity field. Only if you're ET, you can really fly <laughs> on, on bicycles. You need, to, you need to learn by experience that there's a, there's a threshold of speed at which the bicycle stabilizes itself, and you don't have to be exerting too much control, but that if there's traffic in front of you, you have to slow down. You need to start exerting a little bit more control because the bicycle <coughs> control itself. All of that you need to learn by doing, by practicing. The same thing with learning how to swim. You know, you don't tell, you don't give your kid a book on, you know, swimmers of the world, and then throw them in the deep part of the pool, you know. Good luck, kid. Don't forget to breathe. Oh, my God. Glue, 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 glue. You teach him or her by example. You need to be part. Your body needs to be composed with the water. And once in the water, you need to realize that certain rhythmic movements of your limbs will propel you that other rhythmic movements of your limbs will keep you floating, and you learn that by practicing. There's a million things that the human body can learn in, a, in the form of skills. That's why I like circuses a lot, because circuses are typical, typically outside of town, or they used to be when they used to be traveling circuses. They used to be outside of town, they were kind of like temporary autonomous zones, to use the, the term of a friend of mine. In which the human body is, acquires capacities, know-hows, that are just ridiculous, ridiculously useless, you know. The juggler guy, right? And you're juggling things. Or the tightrope walker. I mean, what is that going to be useful for everywhere in your life, right? The trapeze guy, jumping and flying on the air. None of that is learned by reading, by talking. More, more to the point. In any literate society, there's a society that, knows that people know how to read and write, knowing how to read and knowing how to write are skills. Clearly, it's, you know, you repeat the same little letter over and over and over again, and then after it becomes habitual, after, after it has become routine, now it becomes part of your body. And like learning how to ride a bicycle, or learning how to drive a car, you have not done it for a year, and it comes right back. The moment you mount the bicycle again, the moment you get in the car, the moment you start riding, you start reading. 